Today I shall begin to speak of all the history of the temple and its services of worship. I shall begin with a description of the exterior. It was a complete circle in shape, each of the twelve temples were of similar design. The width, or diameter of the big central hall was, in your language, 500 yards across. There was no roof over this central part, it opened to the sky. There was very little rain in Yanini in the early days, and this made the open roof possible. Come with me now to the main entrance of the temple. Twelve immense steps led up to its curved front. Twelve pillars guarded the porch, signifying a separate entrance for each one of the twelve adepts. Then there came a type of portico, or antechamber, where the initiates would meet for quiet converse before or after the services. I really dislike that word. I prefer that you should call them, as we did, daily contacts with the logos. Within this portico, facing the entrant, were twelve doors into the temple. Each door, made of craneth, a type of hard woody substance. Each door, I repeat, was twelve of your feet in height, and four wide. Within, here was a gentle amethyst light, caused by reflectors which caught the sun rays, and passed them through the 49th ray of light, your violet ray. Yours is but another name for it. This, except for the light which filtered in through the open roof, was the only means of illumination. The initiates stood all the time through the entire hours of contact there. If not standing, they were prostrate. No sitting and no kneeling. I must describe this great hall of worship now. It was, if I can describe it so, a twelve-sided circle. In each facet of the circle was placed a block of material, somewhat resembling your stone, and on it there lay a mat of plated leaves. These twelve chairs were the seats of the underlords, or lesser adepts. The great floor was covered with beaten sheets of tahinate, narrators note a copper-like metallic material, and the walls, to a height of 18 feet, were similarly covered. The surface of these walls was mat, as was the floor. I particularly wish to stress this in contrast to the walls of the inner temple. The reflectors, made of a substance very like your mica but called Cronoth, were placed in sconces round the walls, turned to face the open portion of the roof. The walls, above the lining of Tahian Het, were colored in bands of blue, violet, and green, all colored with dyes made by the Yanihis from flowers which grew then. The manner of the making was simple, in every case this type of work was done by the feet, by a crushing or stamping process in shallow tanks, led into the ground. There were no windows in the temple. You must remember that I have already told you that there was no darkness, as you know it, and most important, the light from the solar planes was of far greater intensity than it is now, making of daylight a thing of almost blinding beauty. The X-ray quality of the Yanihi and I was able to stand this brilliant light. The initiates, then, stood in this first great hall of the temple with their underlords seated around them. There was a certain portion enclosed for the purpose of the presence of the animals. Those who had beloved possessions in that plane of life always brought them with them. And why not? Every animal, with five exceptions, grizzly bear, swine, mandrel, snake, ostrich and fish, has a soul, and is capable of worship, in a lesser degree, as you are. Never daybar them. Now for the inner temple as it was called, though actually it was, as it were, an extra circular hall added to the big main hall. In fact, it would resemble in plan, a large figure eight. The inner temple was never used by any but the twelve adepts, and it was here that the great stone of worship was placed. You call them altars. Round the walls, again twelve-sided, were the twelve thrones of the adepts. You must remember that sometimes all twelve would be present at a contact. Our means of travel is swifter than yours. These twelve thrones, grey in color, with inlaid backs of amethyst, lapis, chalcedony, tahinate, and chrysoprase, were twelve feet in height. Each throne was approached by four small steps. From each throne to the stone of worship, which was the center pivot of the circle, lay a deep violet carpet, all converging round the centerpiece like the solar rays. The walls, and a type of frieze which surrounded the aperture to the sky, were encrusted with thousands of precious stones, those which you misguided people call semi-precious. Footnote, semi-precious stones come from the solar planet, made from a plastic substance called by the solar name Shahan. This material is molded and impregnated with cosmic essences and then passes into the laboratories for hardening, to be finally sent to the planets untarnished. It is only when these jewels of God contact Earth that they take on the soiled appearance outside. All solar stones contain life, health-giving essences. Each human should contact High Spirit to know their own individual stone. Diamonds, rubies, emeralds do not contain solar essences. Pearls are a growth, born of an irritation, and sap human vitality. Mother of Pearl is beautiful, you will recollect that I told you that all these stones came from the solar planes. The center stone of worship was made of a pure white substance resembling white coral, and was most minutely carved with flower designs by a race of tiny people who live now, beneath your seas. Then, they lived in the surface soil of flower beds. They are a type of gnome, as you would call them, and are very hard workers. They are directly responsible for the great ivory carving art of China. 
They then carve the great stone, as their contribution to the work for the great artisan of the universe. God can work very hard too, and appreciates efforts of this type. The flat surface was covered by a long runner, made of petrified petals of flowers, preserved in all their perfume and beauty, in a natural condition by means of the eighth medical ray, the Lucanic ray. Now do you see where the name of Luke comes from? The bowl of water, the vase of the green bough, were all carved from the wood of a beauteous tree, and rested perpetually on the stone. You will be told of their use later. There were four steps up to the stone, on each side. It was twelve feet long and six wide. Here I stood, whilst in my own temple, and was able to look upon my children in the violet lit distance. Above the stone, in a slung bowl of lapis, burnt incense made of dried herbs and flowers. These were grown especially for the temple by the twelve female children of the temple rites. You, my daughter, were one. I am confining myself today to a description only of the temple building and its accessories. Next meeting, I shall begin to speak of the rite of contact. The two big school buildings of the initiates were placed one on each side of the main temple building, and there were doors leading from them into the temple itself. When I officiated alone in the inner temple, the twelve thrones of the adepts of course remained unoccupied. The surface of the stone of worship, the table part, was highly polished, and at initiatory rites the flower cover was removed, to allow the concentration of the twelve cosmic rays to pour through the aperture above direct onto the polished surface. You will know, then, that each initiate, in passing through the twelfth rite, the final one, was laid upon the stone directly in the rays. They received such an ecstasy of power and blessing as is undreamt of by you. This twelfth rite, in lament hand days, became degraded to the sacrificial rite, that which you read of in your sacred book of writing. Footnote, the Druids also practiced this blood sacrifice, they were an offshoot of the Lamanian race, I shall continue in our next meeting. Im doc grun amni doc.